Okay. Is that any better? There we go. Well, good morning, everyone. We are in Exodus chapter 17 this morning. Exodus 17, and we'll start in verse 8. So on Thursday, we finished up this section of text that stretches you know, from the end of chapter 15 through the beginning of chapter 17. Uh, a series of miracles in the wilderness. All right, and they're all occasioned by Israel's need. All right, now, Israel's needs are legitimate, right? And we've talked about this several times. They, uh, they're going through the wilderness, and they go for three days without water. All right, that's, that's a serious, urgent thing. Um, but at the same time, they have just witnessed some spectacular things, right? Uh, just otherworldly, divine things. They have seen the pillar of cloud and fire. They've seen the sea split. They've passed uh, at the bottom of the sea on dry ground. All right, so they know that the God that is leading them is powerful, and will take care of them. And so the way that they express this need uh, for water and then for food and then for water again, uh, it's, well, I mean, how do, they, uh, how do they express that need? Yeah, by grumbling and complaining and quarreling with Moses. Um, so we finished that up on Thursday uh, with this final miracle at the beginning of Exodus 17, where they are in need of water, and the Lord tells Moses to take his staff and to strike the rock at Horeb. All right, and we noted just how kind of how ominous this is up until you reach kind of the it's almost like the punchline of it, where God says, You shall strike the rock and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. Because up to that point, we've been getting a, a lot of reminders of what the Lord has done to Egypt, right? And specifically that he has Moses take the staff with which he struck the Nile. Right? And that, that doesn't sound good. <laughs> it's like, you know, take take your take the switch, take the paddle in hand. Right? And you kind of expect what's gonna come next, except in our text, it's not a spanking. <laughs> Uh, instead of uh, instead of Israel being punished, uh, God deals very graciously with them and brings them water from the rock. Um, and on Thursday, we considered you know, some of the spiritual applications of this and the way that this is looking forward. Um, who does Paul identify as the rock? As Christ, yeah, that the the rock that followed them, Paul says, was Christ, right? That uh, the real source of this water is Christ. And I want us to remember that because that, that idea is going to come up again um, in our study in John today, uh, this connection between Jesus and these uh, miracles in the wilderness. All right, so the Lord provides for his people. And that brings us up to today's text, Exodus 17, starting in verse 8. Um, any questions or comments before we pray and begin today's text? All right, then let's bow together. Righteous Father, thank you for the great gifts that you have given us today. I pray, Father, that you bless our time together this morning as we study from your word. Father, I pray that you help us to read faithfully, help us to become better servants in your kingdom. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, Choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek, while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. But whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands grew weary. 
So they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it, while Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. So his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with a sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this as a memorial in a book, and recite it in the ears of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it, The Lord is My Banner, saying, the hand, uh, sorry, A hand upon the throne of the Lord. The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. All right, so this is the first like, armed conflict that we have seen in the Exodus story. And we know that ultimately Israel is heading towards the promised land where they're going to have to wage war against a number of peoples uh, and that they are, they're going to be beset by uh, essentially foreign armies. Although we, we have to use foreign somewhat loosely uh, because we have to remember who Amalek is. Go back to Genesis chapter 36. And this is something that we noticed while we were going through Genesis. Uh, whenever you read through Genesis and you hit the genealogies, you see a lot of familiar names. All right, you look at Ham's genealogy you know, earlier in Genesis. Uh, you look at Ishmael's genealogy. You look at Esau's genealogy, which we're going to now in Genesis 36. You see all of these familiar names. Uh, and in Genesis 36, uh, go down to, let's see, we'll, we'll start in verse 9. These are the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites in the hill country of Seir. These are the names of Esau's sons. Eliphaz, the son of Adah, the, the wife of Esau. Ruel, the son of Bazamat, the wife of Esau. The sons of Eliphaz were Timon, Omar, Zepho, Gatam, and Kenaz. Timnah was a concubine of Eliphaz, Esau's son. She bore Amalek to Eliphaz. These are the sons of Adah, Esau's wife. So in Amalek, we're talking about a, an Edomite people. All right, we're talking about people who were descended from the grandson of Edom. Uh, a grandson by uh, Eliphaz's uh, concubine, uh, Timnah. So not exactly a, a legitimate people. Um, but this is where they come from, uh, which means, I mean, essentially, who are they in relation to Israel? I mean, that essentially makes them distant cousins, right? Because Israel and Esau are brothers. Um, and, you know, obviously the nation of Israel is descended from the man Israel. And the people of Amalek are descended from Esau. Um, so whenever we say, and, and we notice this Again, whenever we were going through Genesis, we see all of these names of all of the, the foreign nations that Israel deals with through their history. All of the nations that we know ultimately, like in the long run, will tempt Israel away from true worship, you know, to worship other gods, to engage in pagan practices. Uh, they're all ultimately related to each other. Right? And so... Uh, these, these people who come and attack Israel are essentially Israel's own family. <coughs> Excuse me. And they attack Israel at Rephidim, where they are encamped, uh, where they've received the water from the rock, um, and where we're going to see that they are very, very close uh, to their, their end point here. They're very close to receiving the law. And this is the point where Amalek has chosen to come out and fight against them. Now, we don't get a whole, whole lot about Amalek in this passage in, in Exodus chapter 17, just that they come out and fight. Uh, the focus is instead on a couple of other things. Um, obviously, this... It's, so, it's not phrased as a, as a miracle, but it pretty clearly is. Um, what happens with Moses' hands, right? Whenever his hand is up, 
Israel prevails whenever his hand is down, Amalek prevails. That, that connection is not explained to us at all in the text. It's not even explained to us explicitly that the Lord is behind it. Right? Now we understand that that kind of has to be the case. That the Lord has to be behind this and that he's using Moses. Um, but it's just presented as, as a thing that happened in the text. Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. Whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. Uh, and so whenever Moses gets tired, they sit him down on a stone and they hold his hands up so that, the, so that Israel wins. <coughs> Excuse me. The other focus of this passage is a, a character that we've not seen before in the text who just kind of suddenly arrives out of nowhere, seemingly. Uh, that's Joshua. All right, the first time that we read his name in Scripture um, is in verse 9. So Moses said to Joshua, Choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. For tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. All right, uh, Joshua, uh, again, obviously we know is going to be very, very important. Um, but our text just seemingly kind of brings him out of nowhere. In fact, it's kind of like, I don't know if you've ever heard this old joke. Um, who's, the, who's the only Bible character, you know, other than, than Melchizedek, um, who has no parents? The only Bible character that has no parents. It's Joshua, the son of Nun. I know, it's a really bad joke. <laughs> I know, it's, it's, a, it's a groaner. Um, but at this point in the text, it's kind of fitting, because we've not gotten any kind of genealogy. In fact, he's not even referred to as Joshua, the son of Nun, in this text. Uh, it's just, here's Joshua. But he's obviously being set up as, a, as someone important in Israel, uh, because not only is he going to command the fighting men, uh, but we're also told this in verse 14. The Lord said to Moses, write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. All right, so part of what this is doing uh, is this episode is introducing Joshua and is setting him up as Moses' successor which we ultimately know is going to happen. Whenever Moses passes on, uh, the leadership of the people does not pass to... Well, who might we expect the leadership of the people to pass to once Moses dies? His sons, yes. Yeah, specifically his firstborn, Gershom. Uh, Gershom, we'll see him mentioned again um, in our next text, but... For the most part, Gershom is, is basically a non-character in this story. Um, in fact, when, we, when was the last time that we saw Gershom? <laughs> it was way back. Not quite that far back, uh, but actually pretty close. It was uh, the last time that we saw Gershom, we were closer to Genesis than we were to this chapter. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll get to specifically where we saw him last in just a minute uh, when we get to chapter 18. So you would expect someone like Gershom, um, or if not Gershom, maybe Moses' younger son, Eliezer, uh, or maybe Aaron, or maybe one of Aaron's sons. You know, somebody related to them, um, you know, closely related to them, and yet... It's not. Um, here in the text, it's, we've already got Joshua singled out pretty early on. And the Lord, again, doesn't give any explanation as to why he's chosen Joshua. Uh, merely that Moses is to record this whole event down and recite it to Joshua as a memorial. <coughs> Excuse me. Because we know ultimately Joshua is going to take leadership. Let's see. Um, ah, there is one other thing that I forgot to mention. Um, and this is about Amalek. 
So we looked back at who Amalek was. Um, I forgot to have us look forward to who Amalek is going to become. All right, so at this point, you know, we read that Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword, but this is apparently not a complete destruction. I mean, that's evident in the text anyway. Right? Moses builds this altar um, because the Lord says to Moses, um, I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. At the end of verse 14. Um, and in verse 16, Moses says, A hand of, upon the throne of the Lord. The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. All right, so they're, they're not obliterated here at this battle. The Lord you know, declares his enmity against Amalek. And he declares specifically, I'm going to blot them out. I'm going to blot out their memory from under heaven. Right? They're going to be among the nations that is to be completely destroyed. And that's important to bear in mind because one of the next times that we see Amalek um, is in 1 Samuel. All right, and that is... Uh, that's quite a while down the, down the road, right? <laughs> 1 Samuel... We are, we're skipping a lot of Israel's history here. All right, we're talking about you know, Israel has made it to the promised land. They've conquered the promised land. Uh, they've gone through the period of the judges. And now we are pretty far into the reign of their first king. All right, and by this point, Amalek still has not been destroyed. And this is going to be one of the major follies of Israel overall, but specifically here in 1 Samuel 15, King Saul. Now, this is Saul's, one of Saul's great follies. 1 Samuel 15, verse 1, Samuel said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people Israel. Now therefore listen to the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came up out of Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. All right, so this is explicitly tied back to our text in Exodus 17. Because of what Amalek did there at Rephidim, you know, when the Lord promises that he's going to blot their memory out from under heaven, uh, this is where he intends to fulfill that. And he intends to fulfill it through Saul. Saul is going to be the one that blots them out. But Saul does not listen to the Lord. So Saul summoned the people and numbered them in Telaim, 200,000 men on foot and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. Then Saul said to the Kenites, Go, depart, go down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the people of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. And Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive, and devoted to destruction all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag, and the best of the sheep, and of the oxen, and of the fattened calves, and the lambs, and all that was good, and would not utterly destroy them. <clears throat> all that was despised and worthless, they devoted to destruction." All right, so Saul only kind of, sort of, listens to the Lord. The Lord says, destroy them all. Saul says, eh, I'd rather keep the good stuff. All right, Saul's got a, a better plan in mind. And so besides sparing all of the good stuff, he also spares this king, Agag. Um, and what we know, and it's, it's funny to see to see these threads go so far through Israel's history. Um, Agag lives, and we find Agag returning, in a, in a sense, much, much later in Israel's history. Uh, so, 
again, think we, at this point in 1 Samuel 15, we are at Israel's first king. All right, they're still united as one kingdom. All right, but we're going to go through Saul, through David, through Solomon. And then after Solomon, the kingdom splits. Um, the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah go through lots and lots of kings. Um, and hundreds of years later, they have become so unfaithful that God sends them off into captivity again. The northern kingdom he sends to Assyria. The southern kingdom he sends to Babylon. Um, and in that period, and we're talking hundreds of years later, uh, whenever Israel has been deported to Assyria, uh, we find the book of Esther. Right? And you remember the basic story of Esther, right? Whenever she becomes queen, uh, who is, so her husband, King Ahasuerus, um, who is Ahasuerus' right-hand man? Who is his favored lackey? Haman, the Agagite. In other words, Haman, the descendant of Agag. All right, that's a story. Whenever you read Esther and Haman makes himself the enemy of the people of Israel and Haman intends to hang Mordecai on the gallows and intends to have all of Israel murdered and plundered throughout the kingdom, that is a thread that starts all the way back in Exodus 17. That's a story that has its roots in Exodus 17, uh, because what Haman is doing is what his, his ancestors have always done in making themselves enemies of the people of God and trying to destroy them. <coughs> Excuse me, so this is the beginning of a very long conflict. I can't believe I almost forgot to bring all that up. <laughs> uh, any questions or comments before we continue away from this? Mm -hmm. Wayne? Mm -hmm. uh, Israel likes to take us in circles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, with the staff. Yeah, we're not. As far as I know, we're not given any spiritual application to that. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Now there was there was something that you asked on Thursday that um, is connected here, and I'll admit I do not have a good answer for this still, um, because or whenever we were talking about the rock that he struck, remember it was the rock at Horeb. Uh, and on Thursday, Wayne had asked about, well, wait a minute, is this the same Horeb that Israel is traveling to? Um, and it's, let, let me just tell you that I am deeply confused on that issue. <laughs> because uh, here's what we're going to read. All right, while they are at Rephidim, we're going to read um, in chapter 18, verse 5 that Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife to Moses in the wilderness where he was encamped at the mountain of God. All right, so that makes it sound like, sound like they have arrived, right? They are at Mount Oreb. Um, they are there. Now, what we're going to read later is that they are going to, in chapter 19, verse 2, set out from Rephidim, and come into the wilderness of Sinai um, and encamp in the wilderness before the mountain. So it almost makes it sound like a different mountain in chapter 19. Um, so that's something that's going to require a little more research on my part. 
Well, that's the thing, is it's, yeah, the, it makes us sound like it's just the one, right? The mountain of God. Um, at, the very, at the very least, though, even if Mount Horeb and Mount Sinai um, turn out to be separate mountains, I want us to consider this. At Rephidim, where they are encamped, where Amalek attacks Israel, uh, they are encamped before the mountain of God. All right, what chapter 18, verse 5 calls the mountain of God. And so whenever Moses goes up on the hill and takes his staff with him, um, and by doing that delivers Israel from Amalek, this is kind of a, a foreshadowing of the next mountain that he's going to ascend. Right? Uh, this, remember, in the, the ancient concept of things, and honestly, this is still kind of a modern concept. You know, where do you typically think God lives? What direction? <laughs> Up, yeah. I mean, everybody, through like all of human history, um, has considered uh, the divine to inhabit the heavens. Um, and it was not uncommon in the ancient world for people, whenever they wanted to get closer to God, well, I mean, remember, what did the people of Babel do whenever they were building the Tower of Babel? They're trying to ascend into heaven, right? And they think they can do that by literally going up. Um, in a sense, what Moses is doing by going up on the hill is not only is he, you know, set up with a vantage point over the battle, um, he is also drawing near to the Lord, uh, which is something that we see explicitly, or that we're going to see explicitly in chapter 19, whenever he is called up on the mountain to be with the Lord. Uh, so, there, yeah, there is a connection there. Um, so, yeah, the hill. Not just any hill. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, uh, any other questions or comments before we pass into chapter 18? Oh yeah, in which in which verse? Mm hmm Oh, like in a footnote or? Mm hmm Yes, yeah, it's referred to as the mountain of God. Yes, yeah, I think we're talking about the same mountain here. the 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 thing that wasn't clear to me is if that mountain is the same mountain on which Moses is going to receive the law. In chapter 19. Yeah, because part of what God tells him in Exodus 3 uh, is that one of the signs that he is who he says he is, one of the signs that he is the true and living God, is that he's going to bring all of the people of Israel back to that mountain um, you know, that, we're, that Moses is at in chapter 3. So part of what we're reading about here in Exodus 17, 18, 19 is the fulfillment of that promise that he's going to bring Israel out of Egypt and to that mountain. So, excellent. Good connection. Uh, any other questions or comments? All right, then let's pass into Exodus chapter 18. Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel his people, how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. Now Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, had taken Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her home, along with her two sons. Excuse me. The name of the one was Gershom, for he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. And the name of the other, Eliezer, for he said, The God of my father was my help, and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife to Moses in the wilderness where he was encamped at the mountain of God. And when he sent word to Moses, I, your father-in-law Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and her two sons with her. Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and bowed down and kissed him. And they asked each other of their welfare and went into the tent. Then Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, all the hardship that had come upon them in the way, how the Lord had delivered them. And Jethro rejoiced for all the good that the Lord had done to Israel, and that he had delivered them out of the hand of the Egyptians. 
And Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh, and has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. For I know that the Lord is greater than all gods, because in this affair they dealt arrogantly with the people. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and sacrifices to God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. The next day Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood around Moses from morning until evening. When Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, What is this that you are doing for the people? Why do you sit alone and all the people stand around you from morning until evening? And Moses said to his father-in-law, Because the people have come to, inquire of, uh, come to me to inquire of God. And when they have a dispute, they come to me, and I decide between one person and another. And I make them to know the statutes of God and his laws. Moses' father-in-law said to him, What you are doing is not good. You and your people with you will certainly wear yourselves out, for the thing is too heavy for you. You are not able to do it alone. Now obey my voice. I will give you advice, and God be with you. You shall represent the people before God, and bring their cases to God. And you shall warn them about the statutes and the laws, and make them know the way that they, in which they must walk, and what they must do. Moreover, look for able men from all the people, men who fear God, who are trustworthy, and hate a bribe. And place such men over the people as chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens, and let them judge the people at all times. Every great matter they shall bring to you, but in a small matter they shall decide themselves. So it will be easier for you, and they will bear the burden with you. If you do this, God will direct you, and, will be able to, and you will be able to endure, and all this people also will go to their place in peace. So Moses listened to the voice of his father-in-law, and did all that he had said. Moses chose able men out of all Israel, and made them heads over the people, chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. And they judged the people at all times. Any hard case they brought to Moses, but any small matter they decided themselves. Then Moses let his father-in-law depart, and he went away to his own country. All right, so it's been a while since we've seen Jethro, um, and he's, he's only here for this one chapter. Now, he's come to bring back Zipporah and Gershom and Eliezer. Um, and we didn't, we didn't get an explicit notice of this back in Exodus chapter 4. Um, but we noted that that was the last time that we saw Zipporah and Gershom and possibly Eliezer. Uh, we're, we're just told explicitly about Zipporah um, and Moses' I don't remember if it's singular son or plural sons. Uh, back in Exodus 4. But do y'all remember what happens in Exodus 4? Yeah, she has to, Zipporah has to take the flint knife and circumcise her son because Moses hasn't done it yet. Right, that's, the, that's the event where the Lord tries to kill Gershom. Um, and after that point, we don't read about Zipporah or Gershom or Eliezer again until here in Exodus 18. So apparently what's happened and you, could, you can see the good sense in this, you know, after God tries to kill your son because of your boneheaded mistake, um, you send them back. Right? So Moses sent Zipporah and his sons back to live with his father-in-law in Zipporah's homeland in Midian. Um, and there they have been this whole time, the whole time that Moses and Aaron have been ministering in Egypt, uh, and telling Pharaoh to let God's people go, and telling the people about their God. This whole time, uh, they've been back in Midian. But now, now that uh, Israel has been delivered, now they're reunited. Now, the way that Jethro knows uh, that he can bring them is that he has heard of all that God has done for Moses and for Israel, his people and how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. <clears throat> Excuse me. One of the things that we've seen God repeat over and over, um, back whenever Israel was in Egypt, uh, was that I am going to get glory over Pharaoh, God says. 
right? I, I am going to, um, the, the sense of it is I, I'm going to become weighty, right? In other words, I'm, I'm going to be taken seriously. I am going to become grave, as it were. Um, and that's precisely what happens. The Lord gets glory over Pharaoh. And the fame of the Lord starts to spread so that Jethro, who's living out in Midian, hears about what has happened. And because of that, he's able to bring uh, Zipporah and Gershom and Eliezer back. Um, you know, one of the interesting things here, so we were given explanations for the names of both of his sons. Gershom means sojourner, for he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. Uh, Eliezer means my God is a help. Uh, for he said, the God of my father was my help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. Now again, when we saw Moses name Gershom, Moses himself had been living in Midian. And we noted there was kind of like a double meaning to Gershom's name because uh, Moses is, you know, whenever he marries Zipporah, he's living in a foreign land, right? He's, he's been cast out and forced to live out in Midian. Uh, and he finds Jethro and his family uh, and settles down with them. And he is a foreigner among them. <coughs> Excuse me. So Gershom, the name Gershom, um, you know, taps into that, that Moses is living in a foreign land. But even if he wasn't living in Midian, right, his, his home country, where he had been exiled from, was also a place of sojourning. Right? Because, Israel, because Egypt is not his home, even though he was raised in the courts of Pharaoh. Um, so it has that double meaning to it, that no matter where we have seen Moses going, he has been a sojourner like Jacob. Right? Jacob identifies himself as a sojourner. And Isaac identifies as a sojourner. And Abraham is a sojourner. But here, now... And again, it's been forever since we've seen Gershom's name appear. Now that we're reminded of it again, the name of the one was Gershom, for he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. Now the circumstances have changed. Because now, what's Moses on his way to? But he's on, as far as he knows, he is on his way to the promised land. He is on his way home. Now, we know that he's not going to make it, right? That, but the sin that causes that has not happened yet. As far as Moses is concerned, he is heading home. Uh, and it's while he's heading home that we get this, this kind of a little reminder that he's been a sojourner this whole time. Just as the people of Israel altogether have been sojourners, but now they are going to their home in the promised land because the God of their fathers was their help, Eliezer. All right, my God is a help, delivering them from the sword of Pharaoh. All right, so Jethro and Moses get together. Uh, whenever Jethro sends this message, you know, they, they greet each other. It, this is what we read in verse 7. The ESV um, kind of makes things a little more sensible in English. Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and bowed down and kissed him, and they asked each other of their welfare and went into the tent. Um, what this renders here is something more like uh, they asked each man to his friend about his peace, you know, about his welfare, his shalom. Uh, but that phrase, it's kind of an odd phrase, uh, each man to his friend. It's important to remember that because of what's going to happen later in the chapter. All right, Moses spends all of his time, all day, every day, listening to disputes. Um, and this is what we read in, uh, we'll start in verse 15. All right, so Jethro sees what's going on and asks him, hey, why are you doing this? You know, why do you spend all day sitting out there? And all of these people are milling around all day. What's going on? Moses said to his father-in-law, Because the people come to me to inquire of God. And when they have a dispute, they come to me, and I decide between one person and another, and I make them know the statutes of God and his laws. 
All right, and again, the ESV has kind of cleaned things up for, for good English use. Whenever he says, I decide between one person and another, it's exactly the same phrase again. I decide between each man and his friend. All right, so the reason that Moses has to spend all day listening to these disputes is because of how dysfunctional things are among the Israelites. Right? And again, the, the phrasing is really odd. It's not just odd in English, it's odd in Hebrew, too. You don't normally see that kind of, like, each man and his friend. You don't see that a whole lot. And in fact, I think before Exodus, like before this passage, I don't think we have seen it. Um, but here, in this passage, we see it twice. Moses and Jethro kind of model the, the ideal for the way that people interact with each other. Right? They've, even though they've not seen each other in a long time, uh, even though they're in-laws, and as we've seen in the scriptures, you know, your relationships with your in-laws can be kind of you know, fraught, a lesson that most modern people still agree with. Um, here we see them, they get together and they are, they're friendly with each other, they're asking each other about their welfare, um, they are, they're dining together. They are at peace with each other, right? And kind of the center of this is, is shalom, right? Well-being, peace. <clears throat> they do not have that in Israel, right? Each man and his friend, they're just fighting all the time. And so Moses, because of their dysfunction, uh, Moses is having to wear himself out. Right? You see, functional friendship, they, just, they go into the tent, they take their ease, they eat their dinner. Everybody's happy and everybody's rested. This dysfunctional kind of relationship is wearing Moses out. And Jethro says it's going to wear the people out too. Right? You and the people with you, verse 18, will certainly wear yourselves out. For the thing is too heavy for you. You are not able to do it alone. Um, and what Jethro promotes, this, this system of delegation that he promotes, look what it ultimately tends to. Verse 23, If you do this, God will direct you, you will be able to endure, and all this people will go to their place in peace, in shalom. Right, again, the, the same thing that we saw Jethro and Moses having with each other. They have shalom. They're asking each other about their shalom. You know, how are you doing? Um, the people do not have it because their relationship is dysfunctional. And Jethro is showing Moses, here's how we make that functional again. Right, so that Israel can finally have shalom. So they can finally have peace. The system that he, put, he advises... Uh, the way that he says you get to Shalom in Israel is by delegating the judgment out. So, verse 21, Moreover, look for able men from all the people, men who fear God, who are trustworthy and hate a bribe, and place such men under, uh, over the people as chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. Uh, and this is a system that is going to endure in Israel, by the way. Uh, we see this come up constantly, uh, just kind of in, in the background of lots and lots of stories in Israel's history. Um, that if you've got a basic matter of justice, where do you go to first? Well, first you go to whoever's the head of your clan. And if it can't be handled in family, or if it's a dispute between families, then you go to, what, do you take it straight to the king? Do you take it straight to the high priest? Who do you take it to first? You take it to the elders at the city gate. Right? You take it, it's, it's, it kind of keeps things at a local level. Right? You start as local as possible and try to resolve the problem there. And if it can't be resolved there, then you kind of step up to the next level. You go speak to the elders. If it can't be resolved there, uh, then you might go speak to, you know, the, well, you could go speak to a priest. Um, you know, if there's a priest near your city, uh, somebody who is serving the Lord for that area where you're in, you'd speak to him. 
Uh, and if that you know, doesn't settle it, then maybe you would go down to Jerusalem and bring your case before the king. Right? But it's only the really hard cases that end up going to the king. Um, so, all of that, again, has its root here in Jethro's advice to Moses. All right, Wayne, I saw your hand up earlier, but I was kind of in the middle of it, so... <laughs> Uh, part of it is so that we get the lesson from it, right? And so, like, and this, we see this happen with so much of the law, right? Um, like, oh, I mean, the first example that comes to my head is uh, is Onan and Tamar. Um, Onan, you know, does not do the the duty of a brother-in-law by Tamar, right? Now, we've not gotten any explanation of the law before that. We get the story first. And it kind of illustrates the need for the law and the purpose for the law. Um, so we're going to see this system put in place, right? That you, you take things up to certain levels. But here we get the story as an object lesson. Um, and God, for whatever reason, chooses to use this Midianite priest, Jethro, kind of as his agent in this. So... Good. We are out of time. Um, thank you so much for your questions and comments and your kind attention this morning. We will pick up, um, I think we'll pick up in chapter 19 on Thursday. There's, although I would, I, I think on Thursday I'd like to start us with an example of Jethro's system uh, at work. So again, it's I think it's interesting to see the way that these things that get set up play out in Israel's history over time. So we'll start with that on Thursday. Thank you so much.